Hi, my name is Jessen Farrell, and I am a candidate for mayor of Seattle. I would love to earn your support. I am running because this is a moment where our city needs leaders who can turn words into actions, who can build bridges, both literally and figuratively, and who are able to get in place a solution scaled to the size of our problems, whether it is public safety, homelessness, climate change, our small business environment. There are so many profound problems facing our city and it is time for a leader with both a fresh perspective as well as the experience to get things done. I um, have been working on large public policy issues my entire career. I'm a former state legislator from Northeast Seattle. I ran an advocacy organization called Transportation Choices Coalition. And most recently, I was the chair of the governor's Task Force on Economic Recovery During COVID. And I'm really proud to have been a part of some of our biggest public policy fights, including getting $80 billion in transportation investments, uh, negotiating our state's paid family leave law, and as chair of the task force during COVID economic recovery, uh, convened small businesses across the state to understand what they needed. And we were successful in getting $50 million allocated to help particularly those businesses that had been left out of federal pandemic relief. As mayor, I would be really excited and honored to get to focus on our largest challenges. I'm looking forward to having a conversation with you today about my plans for addressing the homelessness crisis, public safety, affordable housing, and how to make this a city that is welcoming to everyone. So again, thank you so much for having me join you today, and I look forward to our conversation. Welcome, Jess, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you. So let's start. Let's find out. What will you do? What are your first objectives in your first 100 days as mayor? Well, there are really three things that I think the next mayor needs to focus on. And of course, this is based on my conversations with folks across the city. Number one, homelessness. Um, interestingly, I think there's actually a lot of consensus about what it is that we need to do, but we need a mayor who has the chops to do the politics on it as well as the implementation. But here are the things uh, that I think we need to do. We need more interim housing, 2,000 units of uh, hotels, tiny homes, uh, and FEMA emergency housing. We need to be bringing services, uh, mental and behavioral health services, as regular medical, as well as medical and sanitation services to people who are living unhoused. We need 3,500 units of permanent supportive housing. And when we look at places like Bakersfield, California, that have gotten us almost two, um, who have gotten uh, really uh, made a lot of progress on the homelessness issue, they have also hired caseworkers who know every single person who is living on the street by name, that builds a relationship with them and is able to connect them to the services and housing that they need. So those are the strategies that I would look forward to employing with a great deal of urgency in these first 100 days. Um, and I can keep going. I can talk a little bit about public safety as well. Um, you know, this is a moment where we need a leader who is really willing to articulate a vision and uh, employ the strategies that achieve that vision and then talk about staffing levels. Anyone who has run a large organization or even a small organization knows that you don't start with a conversation about staffing levels. You start with what the objectives and values are um, and those strategies that make uh, the values achievable. And to me, the idea here is that every single person in our community should feel safe. Uh, you know, as you go about your day-to-day -day business. And for too many Black and Brown members of our community, for too many LGBTQ plus members of our community, that is simply not the case. And particularly with respect to our crisis response system, where too often uh, there is escalation instead of de-escalation, we need to fundamentally change that. Um, at the same time, there are other functions of our policing that we do need to be making sure we're investing in, um, you know, property crimes. There's a lot of detective work that goes in, you know, in the background to make sure particularly where crop property crimes are happening, uh, especially if it's a hotspot situation. Uh, the Regional Domestic Violence Task Force, uh, or I'm sorry, the Regional Domestic Violence Unit, uh, which is charged with uh, implementing our extreme risk protection orders, which takes guns away from the hands of abusers. Those officers were actually cut from that um, over, over this last year. So again, you have to start with the objectives and then focus on those functions that actually create safety for people and then scale back and reform and change and transform those things that don't create safety for people. 
Thank you. That's a really, really great comment about about policing and safety in Seattle. There certainly seems to be some some pretty strong cultural conversations around policing in Seattle in terms of how the, the police see themselves and how people see the police. How do you lean into those conversations to create a, an SPD that is the sort of universal support of all the citizens of Seattle? Well, I think that is a really important question. And this is one of the most important things that the mayor is going to have to lead on. Um, and again, I think it starts with that vision of public safety, which is that every single person uh, should feel safe. And for, again, too many people in the LGBTQ community, trans, queer, particularly um, folks of color, do not feel safe when interacting with the police. And again, I mentioned our crisis response system and how often someone might call 911. I think about uh, Charlena Lyles, who was a constituent of mine and killed in 2017 during that election, that mayoral election. So this was clearly, this has been an issue for a long time and we have not adequately addressed it. Um, so part of that, again, as I mentioned, is not just identifying those functions that need to be reformed. It means hiring a police chief who fundamentally shares the values of our city. It means hiring a police chief who is knowledgeable and experienced in culture change. It's hard to change the culture of a department, particularly like the police, but there are people who have experience and who've done that successfully. And in hiring the next police chief, that's something I'm really looking for. Uh, and then negotiating the next SPOG contract. You know, unfortunately, the mayor and the city council actually undermined really hard won accountability measures in 2018. And we cannot go backwards. Advocates won new reforms at the state level. They have won reforms at the city level. And we need to actually use our SPA contract as a, as a way to implement those reforms as opposed to negotiating them away. So those are some of the things that I am really committed to and really centering those voices of folks who are you know, feeling uh, both the, the impacts of being over-policed, but also other people in our community who aren't experiencing uh, true public safety the way we want to, like business own, small business owners, for example. Got it. Thank you. Um, along the, the lines of what the, how the LGBTQ community experiences public services, we know that about 40% of homeless youth identify as LGBTQ. And this is a community that finds shelters to be places that are not necessarily welcoming for them. And obviously sweeping their encampments is another real disruption for that community. It's a very stressed community and many in the LGBTQ community care deeply about them. Mm -hmm. How can we specifically support those young people and get them into stable housing? So there are so many things that we can do that I have worked in partnership uh, as a state legislator with the LGBTQ community and as mayor remain committed to doing. So for example, I talked about caseworkers, really making sure that we have trusted members with lived experience who are able to build relationships with young people who quite frankly have experienced a lot of trauma, who are deeply hurting in some cases, and can help build that trust that can enable people to accept services when often systems have hurt them, right? So those trusted community members with a caseworker uh, mindset is something that's really important. Having uh, cultural spaces that celebrate people for who they are and cherish them really matters. Uh, LGBTQ youth specific housing is something that I am very committed to. I know that there are some elements, some places that are available, but we need to scale that up so that there's not a single young person in our community who needs a safe, culturally uh, relevant space to be and is not turned away because we are lacking. This is a community that has so much wealth and there is no excuse uh, for us to not be able to scale up the housing that uh, young people, particularly young LGBTQ members of our community need. Um, and then finally, in addition to trusted messengers, caseworkers, uh, housing, making sure that we have the medical and health care that is appropriate for young people who may be transitioning. Um, again, too often our systems, particularly our medical systems, can cause trauma. And so we need to make sure that we're really embracing and cherish cherishing every single young person in our community by providing what they need to thrive. Thank you so much. Um, along similar lines, the Another community that the GSBA is, is very much in support of is are small businesses, and particularly small businesses that operate on the street level. They are on the front lines in some ways. They see the challenges we had with the, 
the, with COVID, with protests, with homelessness, like there's lots of Im- challenges impacting those uh, small business owners right now. How do we make this a great city for street level small businesses? What do they need? That is such a great question. And, you know, this is a city of small businesses. And uh, when I was, uh, I once worked as a baker at the Wallingford Bakery. You know, there are a lot of um, small businesses that really are the heart and soul of this city. And uh, we need to cherish, and the city needs to really be a partner in making sure that they thrive. And there are a bunch of things that we can do. And I'll just start by saying, when I was the chair of the governor's task force on COVID economic recovery, I spent the summer and fall listening to small businesses, particularly um, Black and Indigenous and people of color owned businesses, uh, LGBTQ owned businesses. And there were so many things that I heard that we can do to make it easier to run a small business. I talked a little bit about public safety, um, but on the regulatory front, some things just like that, that interfacing with uh, city regulations, we make it really hard to get through uh, city regulations when we're doing, for example, a transportation or infrastructure project. Too often those businesses that, you know, can't afford to close for even a day when we close a street. And yeah. so the city needs to be working really proactively and really centering the voices of small business owners as we are upgrading our transportation infrastructure. We can't afford um, to close a small business for even a day in certain cases. And so really working on the staging involving affected small business owners upfront really matters. Then there's the whole world around access to capital and credit. Um, You know, again, in the pandemic, we learned that, uh, you know, having access to banking relationships, having access to really low cost capital, having access to startup funds, that really matters. And as we're pivoting into recovery, we need to make sure that every single small business owner has access to those kinds of things. Quite frankly, uh, too often it is uh, small businesses, again, may not have access to information. They may not have access to those trusted relationships and, and they may just not have access to a traditional banking relationship. So we need to work proactively both with our financing community and our small business community to make sure that those connections are made so that they can pivot into the recovery and thrive. Got it. Thank you. So as our city, as our city thrives and continues to attract high wage tech workers, and we see our the pressure on our housing, some of our neighborhoods that have historically been lower income, um, more minorities, more people of color, and especially the businesses that are located there feel that they're being pushed out becomes harder and harder for those communities to continue. And those communities really are the heart of the city. How do we protect communities that are being gentrified? So let's just start by saying that there are so many ways community members are experiencing gentrification. I think of elders in the LGBTQ community who made their homes on Capitol Hill and are having a really hard time hanging on living in that community. Um, And so this is a moment where we actually need to go really big and bold on housing. I'm running on a plan that I call ST3 for housing. And the idea is that just as we've been able to make big, bold investments in transit, you know, thinking about Sound Transit 2 and Sound Transit 3, where we unleashed $60 billion in funding across the region, we should be able to take that same robust regional approach to housing. uh, And we really can do it. We know that there's a gap of 70,000 affordable housing in Seattle. That's according to uh, King County's numbers. So we need to build those 70,000 units and we need to make sure that there is a combination of supports to prevent displacement. That can mean providing new pathways to home ownership through community land trusts. It can mean uh, preserving current buildings that are already uh, affordable. It can mean uh, building new social housing that is culturally appropriate so that people can really feel uh, you know, that when they're coming home, they're coming home to a place that loves and cherishes them for who they are. Uh, and it means you know, building new financing mechanisms. One of the things that the city did was uh, create more access to accessory dwelling units, right? Backyard cottages. But we didn't work with the banking community, for example, to figure out how to make sure we're building affordable ADUs. So we need to really link together as we are talking about more housing diversity in every single neighborhood. And I believe every single neighborhood is on the hook for taking uh, on economic, racial, and housing diversity. Um, We really need to be pairing 
all of those solutions that work, whether it is public subsidies, uh, subsidized infrastructure, financing mechanisms, new pathways to ownership, and we need to plan for it and then implement it to get to those 70,000 units we need. Got it. Thank you. So one question, I, uh, this is going to be my last question, unfortunately, but I really wanted to ask you about, I noticed in your in your plan that you see birth to five childcare as basic infrastructure and intend to actually build that out at our city. That's a major program. Tell me, how, tell me your yeah. plans there. Yeah, you know, I think the really interesting thing here is that in the post, you know, as we're pivoting into this post COVID world, we're not there yet. Uh, you know, Seattle is not just competing against places like Austin and San Francisco, you know, our traditional kind of tech cities, but we're now competing against places like Boise and other places that have low cost lifestyles. And the thing that's on my mind, though, is that any worker who has kids is going to need to have to have access to child care. And so really making big, bold investments in child care for this city actually becomes a way to promote our competitive edge against those other cities that we are now competing against, both our traditional competitors and these new competitors. And so there are really three components. You may be aware that the Biden administration is actually um, creating payments now for uh, families under very, you know, at certain income levels, up to $300 per child. The city could match that. It's about 1800 bucks a month to put a kid in full-time childcare. Um, but if we were subsidizing families, $600, that's a great step. So that's step one. The second step is to fully subsidize all, all child care facilities. We should treat child care the same way we treat K through 12 education. It's free, it's universal, and we know it's good uh, for our earliest learners to put them in really great environments. So just as we publicly subsidize K through 12, we should do that same thing with our um with our spaces. And then finally, we need to support childcare workers. That's a really important um, uh, sector that people who work in that sector often struggle economically. And uh, we should look at doing a portable benefits pilot project where benefit where um, childcare workers have access to medical benefits, retirement benefits, et cetera, uh, so that you don't have to take an economic hit for doing such a really important job. So those are some of the elements of how we start to get to that. Um, and I really look forward to working with the business community to do this because it really is in all of our interest. Great. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I look forward to earning your support.